thank you for the cross, for the resurrection. We're here this morning to hear from your word. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would mold our hearts to see through your eyes. We give you praise, we give you glory. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Drew? just 
close your eyes and, and, and pick something. Most, most gardeners do not garden that way. You don't just, you know, pick a random bag and maybe it'll kill it, maybe it'll make it grow, who cares? You throw it on. That's not a typical gardener. And in John 1, or John 15, 1, Jesus says, my father is the gardener. And just like most human gardeners, the God, the gardener, he knows his garden. He created his garden. We are his garden. He created us specifically in the same way that you plan out your garden specifically. You choose the plants. You choose the arrangements. You choose the mulch. You choose all of these things, which vegetables, which flowers. You choose all of these things. It's not random. We're not here by chance. This is not how God has planted his garden. This is not how most people plant their garden. So just like a human gardener, God knows his garden. God loves his garden. Now, there are a couple of you that hate your gardens, but for everyone else, you take care of your garden because you like it, because you want it to grow, because you enjoy it. The things you do are not intended to hurt the garden. You don't think, I bet that will kill my flowers. I'm going to buy some of that. And if you do, you probably only have to do that once because it probably will kill your flowers and then your garden is finished. So in the same way that a human gardener loves their garden, God loves his garden. And we are his garden. And you want the best from your, for your garden. And you want the best from your garden. You want your plants to be healthy. You want them to have strong roots so they can take a storm. You want them to have green leaves. You want them to have pretty flowers. You want healthy plants. Healthy above the ground and healthy below the ground. God wants the same for us. God wants us to be healthy. And God does things in order to make us healthy in the same way that a gardener does things to make his garden healthy. God also wants the best from us. Typically, you plant a garden to get something, whether you get flowers, whether you get butterflies, whether you get citrus, whether you get vegetables, whether you get herbs, whatever kind of garden you have, typically you're, you're wanting some fruit from that garden. Most people don't plant an orange tree and hope they never get oranges because they hate oranges. That's, that's not a normal thing to do. Uh, maybe someone's done that one time, but that, that's not a normal thing to do. So you want fruit from your garden. That's most of the point of having a garden is to get the fruit from it, to get the produce from it, to get the, the enjoyment of the flowers, the colors, to get the fragrance, the smells. That's the point of a garden, and that's what God's purpose is for us. God wants us to bear fruit. Now, verse 2, now we get, we, we tend to like verse 1. You know, God, God planted us. God planted our garden. He likes us. He takes care of us. He knows us. These are all very nice things. It's very, very pleasant things to think about. But when you have a garden, especially if you have, and here we talk about vines. I don't know a lot about vines. Most of my experience with vines is they're bad and we need to get rid of them. So I'm going to shift a little bit and talk more about trees because that's more <coughs> what I know. But it's the same principles apply. So in verse 2 it says, He cuts off every branch. And then it goes on to say, He prunes the branches that do bear fruit. He cuts off every branch that does not bear fruit. So in that, that's a complete removal of a branch. And in our lives oftentimes, we have branches that are not producing fruit that will never produce fruit. A lot of times, these are just straight out things that you're doing them and you don't need to do them. You never should have started, you shouldn't continue, and they're never gonna produce any kind of good fruit. A lot of the, a lot of the obvious ones would be sin. If you're in an adulterous relationship, that, that, that's never gonna bear good fruit. You need to just get rid of that right away. But I do believe that there are also branches in our lives that some people can have the branch and it's fine. And other people cannot have that branch. And I don't like to admit things like this because I don't, I don't like the idea that certain things are okay for some people and they're not okay for other people. 
But if we're honest, we know that that's actually true. I don't like to say that because then people take it and just say, well, for me it's fine. No, adultery is not fine for you. I, I, don't, I don't care who you are. Adultery is not okay. You know, stealing is not okay. I don't care who you are. But there are things, and one pretty simple example that's not a personal example for me really, but that might hit home with some people, is just something simple like gambling. Now, let's just say that gambling is a branch. You have a gambling branch. If your gambling branch is that if you don't win, you don't eat because that's your paycheck that you're gambling away. If you come home and, and your wife says, did you get the groceries? No, but I got some scratch-offs, so don't worry about it, we're good. And by the way, I, I got some scratchers and I won $50, so then I bought 10 more and, and lost that $50, and now we're not gonna eat this week. <coughs> That's a problem. That's a problem. If you're watching a football game with your spouse and you like the green team and your wife likes the red team and you're kind of having a little friendly back and forth, you say, you know what, your team wins. All washed the dishes. I think that's a harmless form of gambling. So, in that way, you can say that for some people, maybe, maybe they can gamble. Maybe they can spend a dollar or two dollars a week on Powerball and they never miss it and they don't care if they win or not. But not everyone can do that. And I, I use that example because my personal example that I'm about to use, I don't want anyone to really get the wrong idea and say that that I'm saying it's completely wrong. What I'm saying is I can't do it. And it will, it's, it's the off season right now, so it's, it'll be a little bit easier to hear than it was a, a couple weeks ago. But for me, one branch that I believe with all my heart that God has completely removed from my life is watching football. And I'm not here to say that no one can ever watch football. I'm not here to say that. I'm not here to say that you watching football is wrong, you watching football. But the way that I was doing it, I guarantee you, was wrong. Because during football season, Saturday at noon is when the game, the football, college football games start. And I would turn them on. I don't care who's playing. You know, if it's South Dakota A&M versus West Alaska, I will pick a team and root for them. And if they lose, I will be angry. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's playing. It will ruin my day if West Alaska loses to North Dakota A&M. It completely ruins my day. Okay? And that's at noon. They usually don't have really good games at noon. So they finish around three, but then there's games of three. I've watched those. Those are usually a little bit better. Then they've got games of three, and then usually at, at six, there's a, a game that's not quite finished yet, so you kind of can hold over until seven when the real primetime games start. And I watch that. And then the West Coast games start about nine, and again, I don't really care who the <coughs> these teams are, but it's football, so I'm watching. And Basically, my Saturdays during football season were from noon to midnight watching football. And 80% of these teams, I don't care if they win or lose. And I just convince myself that I do care who wins and loses. And then Sunday rolls around. And Sunday is professional football, and I repeat the process all over again. And if it's 4 p.m. on Saturday during football season, and I, I, have, to, I have some kind of obligation, I'm, I'm really angry about this ob obligation because how am I going to know if West Delaware wins or not if I have to go to this meeting? This is not okay. So I would spend probably 20 hours, 20, and then there's of course Monday Night Football, and of course there's Thursday Night Football, which are, are, I can't miss. I don't care who, if there's one team 1-11 and one team's 0-12. I really want to see if that 0-12 team's going to get a win or not. I'm really, I'm really interested in this. And at some point, you know, especially when I'm watching my team, this was the real kicker, when I'm watching my teams play, and I realize that, of course, if my team loses, it, it ruins my day. And usually my next day, usually my next day, and, and a lot of times my next day. So I've, I've ruined four days because my team, and because my teams lose a lot, that was a lot of ruined days that I had. And the thing is, if they won, I wasn't happy. I was relieved that they didn't lose. So if they win, I'm not happy. And if they lose, I'm miserable. And, and, and I feel like God just told me, what are you doing? Why do you keep doing this? Are you enjoying yourself? Do you, do you, do you like being miserable? 
Because I'm not going to switch teams to one that wins all the time. That, that's just totally cheap. I'm not going to do that. I'm sticking with my teams. And it just, it just made me completely miserable. And I feel like God said, Get, that branch is not going to produce fruit. You can't handle this. You can't watch two hours of football a weekend. You can't do that. You're either going to watch 25 or you're going to watch zero. And I feel like that, and that was, at the time, it was a difficult decision. And honestly, I don't really watch football anymore. If I have to, I, I really try not to pay attention because I will get involved. If one player does something I don't like, I hope his team loses and, and he gets cut and, and it just goes on from there. It's just the tiniest thing. I can't handle it. And I feel like God completely removed that branch from my life because it was not producing any fruit. And I'm not telling anyone here that you can't watch football. If you're watching 25 hours a week like I was, probably shouldn't do that. Pro probably not, not, not great. It wasn't great for me. Probably not going to be great for you. So there are things in our lives that may not be actually spelled out in the Bible as a sin, but that are not producing fruit. It's not killing you, but it's not producing fruit. And it doesn't need to be in your life if it's not producing fruit. So there's also pruning that takes on a different kind of cut. So this is not a complete removal. In a pruning cut, you don't cut right up against the trunk. When you cut right up against the trunk, ideally it never grows back again, and it will heal over. A pruning cut, you leave a little stump. And, hopefully, with trees it's always hit or miss, but typically, if the branch is big enough, and if it's healthy enough, and you cut it off, a new branch will start from the stump. And if it's a big enough branch, then multiple branches will start from that stump. And if it's a really big branch, a whole bunch of branches will start from that stump. So you will cut one branch off and get a flush of growth at that cut point. And now, and let me say, before I, before I go on, I just need to clarify something that's going to come up. Just so we're clear on what my beliefs are or what my beliefs are not. I do not believe that trees have feelings. I don't believe they experience pain or sadness or a sense of loss, or regret, or any of these things. I don't believe that. But I'm going to talk about them like they do, because I think it's helpful, and because, in my example, the trees represent us. So when I say cutting a branch off hurts the tree, I, I really believe that. But it's a lot easier to talk about if, if, I, if we just use that vocabulary just for today, and then afterwards I won't say you hurt the tree anymore, and it's, it's sad, and it's long. I'm not going to say that anymore after today. But for today, I, I, I will say that just because it's so I have some pictures, I hope, here. This is from the, I took that on the golf course this morning. And let's see if I can get my laser. Doesn't look like I got my laser. Oh, there it is. Oh, that, that, that was bad. That was bad. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Technical difficulties. I might not use the laser anymore. One more try. We got the laser there. It's not on the screen. All right, fine. It was it's still fun to play with. <coughs> All right. So anyway, it's not going to show up on the screen. But what you see here is you can see this different colored knob on this, this oak tree. This oak tree we planted probably... Uh, that must have been... 15 years ago, we planted that oak tree, and it was obviously old when we planted it. But as it's grown, we've pruned it routinely. And that branch is low to the ground, and we're a golf course, so if it's low to the ground, you can't drive under it, you can't play. It's, it's not going to do any good for anyone. Okay? It, it, it's not going to magically scoop up the tree and be out of the way. So it's a low branch, it was probably hanging down, it was hitting carts, it was hitting. So you say, you know what, that branch has just got to go can't save it. It's not doing what we want it to do. It's not producing the kind of fruit that we want it to produce. So we cut it. We cut it right up against the tree. And it hurt the tree and the tree was sad. Okay? And again, I don't believe that, but we'll just go. But the, the tree put a lot of energy into that branch. It put a lot of nutrients into that branch. It takes a lot for a tree to grow a branch, especially one that was that size and that length 
had that many leaves on it. It forked so many times. That tree was invested in that branch. And the tree really, it doesn't know any better. The tree can't see itself. The tree doesn't know it's on a golf course. It doesn't know that branch is in the way. The tree is, is oblivious. But the gardener, or in our case, the, the maintenance workers, we can see the whole picture. We can see, you know what? That branch is not good. That branch needs to go. That tree and us, we're all going to be better off if that branch leaves. So we cut the branch off. And when you cut a branch off, you know, a tree has, a, has bark on it. And that bark protects the tree. It's a barrier. It's a barrier against insects. It's a barrier against disease, against bacteria, against fungus. That trunk or that uh, bark is a protection. It's a shield. And when you cut that, you have exposed wood there. There's no shield on that wood. So the tree is exposed. The tree is hurt. The tree is now exposed to the elements. And, and things can get in. Insects can get in a fresh cut because it's much easier because they can break through the shield. So the tree is now vulnerable. The tree probably did not appreciate us hacking off a really big branch way down there. The tree probably maybe had some anger towards us. Again, I don't believe this, but just, just work with me. So when we see the picture, we, we get rid of it. And you can, you can tell there, again, it's, it's, not, it's not the same as the rest of it, but that is now covered. It has now regrown a barrier, and that branch doesn't grow anymore. It's not the tree is no, no longer putting any energy into this branch that's going nowhere. The tree has redirected that energy. And now it's putting energy into branches that are doing what we want them to do. And God does the same thing with us. God will remove a branch. And it might be painful. It probably will be painful. No one says, boy, I sure would like to lose this thing I put all this time and effort into. But in the long run, it's better, we're better off. Because God is the gardener and God knows what he wants from us. And what he wants from us is what we should strive for. And so if God removes a branch, God knows what he's doing. And it might hurt. It might be painful. It might take a while to heal over. But in the long run, we're going to look the way that God wants us to look. All right? Now this is another oak tree, just about 300 yards away. This tree was a nice, big, flourishing tree until something came along called Hurricane Matthew. The tree fell over. The tree was on the, on the side of a uh, little pond, fell over. The roots were sticking 12 feet up in the air, laying on the ground, blocking the road. Big problem. We're so heavy, heavy that we can't pick it up with our, our big machines. So there's nothing to do. We said maybe. Maybe, even though it fell over, maybe we can save the tree. But the only way we can save the tree is we've got to get all of this weight off. We've got to cut all these branches off. But you can see we've left. See the branch goes up and there's a, it stops. And these branches are about that big around. The branch goes up and it stops. And there's a flush of new growth at the end. So what we did was we cut them all off. And, and we don't know if this is going to work because we're humans. But we cut all of those off, tried to leave as many as we could, because the more cuts that you make, the more growth points that you have. And we got it light enough, and we got it small enough, that we just tipped it back over. See what happens. And as you can see, that was, Matthew was about 18 months ago. And as you see, it's grown back. It now has growth instead of death. And a lot of times, and I have not, I don't think, I know I have not. I have not personally experienced this. But I know people who have, and perhaps some of you in here have. When you feel like the storm just, just completely knocks you over, knocks you over, uproots you, you, you've lost everything. I know people who have lost their families and their homes and their vehicles and their money and their jobs and everything that they had is gone. And that they, they got nothing. And a lot of times, the first thing you think is, well, I'm done. My roots are sticking up in the air. I'm done. Forget it. But sometimes God comes along and God says, I'm going to cut these branches off. And it's going to hurt. But then I'm going to stand you back up and you're going to start growing again. And there's another tree just, again, across the way. Same thing. Maple tree. Maple tree, again, fell over. Roots are sticking way up in the air. We cut all the ends off. Stand it back up. All of those cuts that we made, new growth is coming out. 
in the long, in the long run, we'll, we'll see how long it lives. But it's been, again, it's been 18 months, and it's still growing. And so, a lot of times, God will prune us. God will cut a branch, the leaves some, but cut the branch off. And new growth comes out of his cut. A good example, I think, of this that, that we're experiencing right now is that we were at Imagine for three years. And I believe, and I think we all believe, that God has cut that branch, cut that Imagine branch. But he's left some, and now we've got a new branch called FPC that's now growing. And that move to here, I, believe, I, I absolutely believe it's a wonderful move, but it cost us a lot of money. We had to buy a lot of things that we didn't need before. We are, we're having to figure everything out all over again, how to set up, how to, how to do communion, which way we should go, where we should come in. There's been a lot of work that's been involved. And it's, I wouldn't say it's been exactly painful, but it's been a lot of effort. We've had to put a lot of energy into starting this new branch. However, I also believe that as the good gardener, God knows what he's doing, that God knows what he wants from us, and that God is intentionally doing these things in order for us to produce more fruit. And I'm thrilled about what he's going to do. Verse 3, God says, You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given to you. And when we look at our lives and we think, you know, I've, I've got these branches, I've got all this stuff going on, but how do I know if, if this is a branch that should be pruned or if this is a branch that should be removed or if this is a branch that's just fine and it's doing wonderful? Well, God says here that the Word of God prunes our lives. It indicates what should stay and what should go. And again, we talked earlier about if it's an outright sin, the, if the Bible says you should not do it ever, then you should not do it ever. This is not a discussion. This is not, not a back and forth. This is not a negotiation. If the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery, then you probably shouldn't commit adultery. And if you are, that branch needs to be removed immediately because it's not going to produce any fruits. In verse 4 and 5, go together. In verse 4 and 5, Jesus says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So, we, I've been talking about trees, and we'll continue to talk about trees. So, in this, Christ would be the trunk. The leader, if, if you're really into trees and horticulture. Christ is the leader, and we're, we're the branches that hang off of the leader, of that hang off of Christ. Now, the branch has a, a much more a unique position, let's say. The branch is permanently attached. The branch does not come and go. It's not a bird that flies and lands on it and then flies away. It's not Spanish moss that hangs on it and falls off and hangs on it again and falls off and hangs on it again. It can't be blown away by the wind. It's not an insect that crawls on it and maybe goes to a different one, maybe moves around. The branch is permanently attached. And we, as Christians, whether we like it or not, believe it or not, are permanently attached to Christ. When you make Christ the Lord of your life, we become attached to Christ. And we have no fruit when we're separated, but we have death instead. Now a branch, if you cut a branch off of an orange tree, the, the branch will never make another orange. It's done. As soon as it's separated from the vine, and the, there is nothing. It's got to be attached to produce fruit. And when it produces fruit, it doesn't do it itself. The, the, the nutrients <coughs> flow up from the roots and go out through the trunk and end up on the branches. The branch does not make fruit. Again, if you need evidence of this, cut a branch off and see if it makes fruit. It doesn't. The branch doesn't make the fruit. The branch's job is to hold the fruit or bear the fruit. I didn't know which word I had. But it bears the fruit. It holds it. It doesn't make the fruit. 
It displays the fruit, it keeps the fruit up off the ground. That's what the branch does. And that's what we do. We bear the fruit that Christ produces. That Christ is doing the work through us. But it doesn't come from us. It's not out of our own effort. It's not because we try really, really hard. It's not because we really focus and because we do all of the right things. It is Christ doing them through us. And this is just, this has really spoken to my heart recently because, again, I've, as a church, we're going through a new period. <clears throat> and it, it is, it is something that's ending. And we've all had things that have ended, whether you've moved, whether you've changed jobs, whether you've changed churches. All of these things are, think, are, are an ending. And whenever you have an ending, at least whenever I have an ending, there's always a little bit of pain. There's always a little bit of this is the way that it's been for a long time. And I'm used to it. And I'm comfortable with it. And it's, it's been good. It's, it's produced fruit. Again, these branches that God is pruning, they have produced fruit. So you can say, well, look, I should keep the branch because it's produced fruit. And I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose this. There's a story in Acts. Acts 8. In verse 4, it talks about Philip. And Philip is in Samaria. And Philip has a flourishing ministry. Everywhere that Philip goes, people listen to him. People believe what he's saying. People accept Christ. And he's, by every human indication, Philip is doing great. He's doing fantastic. Why would he ever leave? And God comes along, God prunes that branch. Because God says, Philip, you got to get up. And you got to leave. you got to leave this thing that's going wonderful. Because I've got something else for you. And then Philip goes and meets the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip left a ministry where he's reaching all kinds of people. To go reach one person. And it says Philip got up and went. He didn't question it. Philip did it. So, we don't know really if Philip... If he had misgivings or if he thought, I wonder if I've been doing something wrong here or what's going on. And he gets there, there's one guy. I just, I wonder if he ever wondered why did, like, I was reaching all kinds of people every day and now I'm reaching one person. Like, that's less. Like, do the math. Lots, one. That, why am I going down? Like, what's going on? And what history tells us is that Ethiopian eunuch, after Philip ministered to him, after the eunuch understood now the gospel, understood who Christ was and what he had done for him. That Ethiopian eunuch, history tells us, went back to Ethiopia and spread that word. So that Philip, maybe from his point of view, was reaching dozens of people every day in Samaria and then left that to reach one person. But that one person produced untold numbers of fruit because he took it back. He took that message back with him that Philip gave him. He took that message back. And it's spread all over the country. And we never know what God is doing. But we know that when God makes a cut, it is to produce more fruit. Or that he's removing something from us that does not produce fruit and will not produce fruit. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, we, we just thank you so much for, for what you've done for us individually, God. For what you've done for us. As a group, we thank you for everyone who's, who's come today. Lord, we just pray that, uh, that we would just accept your pruning, God, and that we would allow you to, to work in us, that we would trust you, that what you're doing is for our good, that what you're doing is because you love us, and that you know what you're doing. And Lord, we have faith that all these things are true. And Lord God, as we go about our, our individual lives, Lord, that we come to decisions, we come to crossroads, we don't know what to do, we don't know what to keep, we don't know what to give up, we don't know what to commit to, we don't know what to stay away from. Lord, I just pray that you give us the wisdom and guidance that we need. I pray that you would make your will clear to us. And Lord, I just, again, continue to pray that you would work through us, that you would produce fruit in us, 
that you would have us to produce. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, thank you for taking the time to prune us, to clean us, to purify us. Lord, we are your people. And we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.